great. Well, it's it's great to be here. Uh, thank you, Sylvan, for inviting uh, me and my colleague as well, Jan, uh, from earlier. You may have attended his session. Um, I'm going to switch back from this slide. So if you need to download the sample data that we're going to be working with, then please go ahead and do so. I'll give it like a few seconds and then we'll, we'll, we'll jump back to the, the start. Um, and as Sylvan said, you know, this is a workshop. We're gonna work through some cases together. Uh, in those cases, my goal is for us to get familiar with a tool. There are many tools to work with geographic information or geographic data. Uh, we're gonna work with one tool that is free and open source, QGIS. Um, but you know you can do this type of work with with many other tools. I don't want to to limit it, but this is a pretty good way to get started in this type of work and to do this type of analysis. Um, so we're going to be working with geospatial tools, um, and we're going to be taking a look at satellite imagery. But we're also going to be taking a look at AIS, uh, which is AIS data, which is. Uh, it's, it's kind of ship or vessel responder data. So th these are like individual pings of locations of ships that get sent out. We're also, if we have time, uh, we can take a look at some uh, ADSB data, which is what, it's similar to the AIS data, but it's for flights or planes, right? So um, both, you, they're analogous. So if we do one, you, you'll be pretty much familiar with the other one. Um, my name again is Eric Barrett. Um, I am the data desk manager for OCCRP, uh, and I'm part of the research and data team at OCCRP. Uh, OCCRP is the Organized Crime and Corruption Reporting Project. That is a mouthful, and I'm sorry for that. Let's just call it OCCRP, or as our adversaries call us, oh crap. Um, we have our own newsroom and uh, our own investigative support. We are we work as a sort of network, so we have a core staff, but we have member centers all over the world, local member centers in, in different countries, and we work together on cross-border investigations that involve crime and corruption or organized crime. Um, uh, our staff is about, uh, almost, wow, well, yeah, it's, it's, it's grown a lot over the past uh, few years. We have our headquarters in Amsterdam, and OCCRB started very small about 15 years ago. Um, this, again, is the data. Uh, so we'll take a look at a few case studies, and then we'll do some examples of uh, how we kind of went through or analyzed the data to that ended up in some published stories that we did. Um, this is our website to give you an idea of the types of stories that we publish. I think uh, this is a pretty good representative. This is from today, but gives you a good idea of the types of stories that, that, we, that we publish. Uh, obviously, we can see here uh, a project that we started last year, the Russian Asset Tracker, uh, for which we won the European Press Prize recently. Um, Swiss Secrets, uh, so basically leak data. We work with a lot with leaks. Um, and if you attended the Jan's section, session earlier on Aleph, he gave you a, a taste of, of the nature of that and how we work with the leaks. Um, okay. So this was a story we did a couple years ago. Uh, this is uh, it's Nicaragua's forgotten deforestation crisis. And basically, the idea of the story was that we, we wanted to take a look at the nature of deforestation within the country, so the, the loss of vegetation. Um, but what was interesting is we wanted to also compare that with, uh, with specific areas that are known to be sort of like preserved, preservation, like areas that you shouldn't touch and also areas that are inhabited by indigenous peoples uh, within the country. And so basically what we're looking at is a cross-reference of two different things. Um, and so we used some satellite data to, to take a look at some, bef some changes in uh, vegetation over the area over several years, um, and then also looked at how that correlated with uh, these specific areas of uh, indigenous peoples. So to give you kind of a look, this is QGIS. This is pulling in uh, some satellite imagery that has been uh, processed a bit. 
Um, and basically we have a sort of a binary situation here where we have uh, vegetation and non-vegetation, so zeros and ones. Um, uh, not the data that we're going to look at today is not zero and one, it's continuous, right? So, but here we could see like the idea was is that f f this process data from Global Forest Watch uh, was processed in a way where we could like see where there was vegetation and then when it disappeared over the years. And so like, basically this is, this is like over time, right? So this is at the beginning, this is at the end. Um, basically, we converted that to vector data, and we'll talk a bit about that in a second, um, and then process that into a way that we could do some kind of what, what we call area uh, density of a specific values. Um, so if you want to take a look at how things change within an area, we can, we can divide up an area into different smaller subsections and then take some values and see how that changes over time. So that kind of begs the question, and I understand that our audience is quite diverse, so please forgive me if this is elementary information, but I want to start with the sort of basics um, before we dive into the, the mechanics of how we might approach these problems. Keep in mind, there, again, there are many ways to solve the same problem, um, and I'm gonna give you what I consider to be a very straightforward, simple approach, uh, but you can take this as far as you want or make it as complicated as you want. Um, so what is satellite imagery? Uh, it's a workshop. I mean, maybe somebody wants to run up to the mic and give me an answer. Uh, uh, but in short, basically, you have a sensor that takes readings or measures something from a distance. Um, and so a satellite is something that is, orbits the Earth, um, and it has a variety of sensors, and it can measure things at different points of time uh, over an area. Uh, of the Earth uh, or of the atmosphere, um, and then take measurements using those different sensors. Those different sensors can be a wide variety of things. Don't think that they're just a, an optical camera, right? We, we're thinking, we have to think much bigger than that, um, and we'll get to that in a second. So it basically, satellite imagery or satellites basically fall within a sub, uh, it is a subset of a larger type of study or field called remote sensing, and that's just that. Like, uh, th uh, yesterday I was walking uh, around and there was the booth that was taking, that was detecting the um, uh, electromagnetic frequency given off by uh, HDMI cable and recreating the images of the screen um, by processing it. And I don't know if anyone saw that, but technically that's remote sensing, right? Like it, it captures information from a distance and then processes or does something with it. Um, so. Uh, but when we deal with satellite imagery, we work with, you know, we have a platform, basically in this case the actual satellite itself, um, a sensor, uh, we measure the data, so it's the data itself, but then also we, we combine that with what is called contextual data. Now, I mean, we may assume that all satellite imagery, satellite data has GPS uh, uh, corrected image, like information, but it doesn't. And so oftentimes the measured data and then the GPS data is, is corrected post-processing. So contextual data can be also just GPS data, but can be a wide variety of other types of information, such as the tilt of the, the, tilt of the camera vis-a-vis um, -vis perpendicularity of the, of, of, from the Earth, et cetera. Uh, so satellites, you know, they have spatial location, temporal over time, and spectral, that is the, the type of things that it's measuring uh, with its sensors. So satellites, like I said, like the sensors can do, can, it's not just optical, uh, it can, they can measure, for example, you can have uh, uh, radar, or you can have a variety of other types of sensors. Um, the, the cameras that we tend to think of though, What's interesting is they, what they capture is electromagnetic radiation. They measure electromagnetic radiation, basically different uh, ranges of electromagnetic wavelengths um, that bounce off objects and come back into the sensor. Um, and so you, if you think about just a normal image, right, and normal image is, is comprised of usually what we think of as three bands or three types of wavelengths, uh, blue, green, red in that order from from highest energy to least, uh, but 
uh, there, it also captures a wide variety of things that are not visible to the eye. And that's where things can get really interesting in terms of measuring things from a distance that our eyeballs can't necessarily see. Um, and I think that's where a lot of the fun comes in when we talk about you know, answering questions like, um, okay, over this area between, between you know, 2016 and 2023, was there a decrease in vegetation over this area? And what was the percentage of decrease in vegetation? We can start to answer those types of questions even with cameras or with sensors uh, kilometers above the earth. Um, and that's really interesting. So the af we also have, we have uh, wavelengths that are captured below or like um, the blue, so on the other side, and then we have wavelengths that extend on the near infrared, which is just past what is optically visible for humans, and then well beyond those wavelengths uh, down into like microwaves, etc. So we can see here that what is visible is these narrow bands we can see visually at the top, this red, uh, blue, green, red, but we can see that what is measurable is qu is is quite a bit wider in scope, right? And so the, the question is, what can, we, what can we measure with that? Uh, or what, what can we capture and what can we do with that information? What can it, what can it tell us that, that we, we can't tell with our, with our own eyes? Right, so there are different kinds of satellites um, that orbit the Earth and each one has different capacities. Uh, a variety, and there are a lot of variables. And so when we think about, s when there's a question, about like so, for example, um, are there little green men in you know s southern or eastern Ukraine? You know how do we can we use satellite imagery to measure that? Well, it depends. Yeah, we can, but we have to use if we're trying to answer that question, we need a, uh, what's called a resolution or a precision that is going to allow us to capture that level of detail. Whereas there's a lot of free satellite data that is not as precise. It's very useful in, another, uh, in, in other areas such as ve measuring vegetation, but we can't answer the same, we can't answer all questions with the same satellite, the same uh, imagery, the same data, right? They, we have to match the right satellite data, the right satellites with the question that we're trying to answer. And that's an important part of the process is finding out if we can access that or do we have enough money to, to, to pay for it if, we, if, we, if, we, if it's not free, um, which is as I work in journalism, right? That's, that's always an issue. Um, so this is the Landsat uh, satellite. The Landsat has been, it's a program that's been going on for decades um, out of the US and uh, since, since, since space uh, uh, program started, and we can see here, like this is like the latest number, like we have 11 bands here. Uh, these bands correspond to different wavelengths. We can see the, the wavelengths in micrometers in the center, um, and then the resolution. We'll talk about resolution in a second. I have some images to kind of clarify what that means because it's, I can explain it in words, but it's easier to see it. Um, this is Sentinel-2. Many of you may be familiar with that. This comes up quite often, like w in, in the previous sessions on cocaine smuggling, um, th there was discussion about uh, Sentinel Hub and the, the data from Sentinel Hub. And so this is from Sentinel 2, and we can see here that there are 13 different bands of data. And, each, and so we have like the normal blue, green, red, but we also have the und uh, above the blue uh, coastal aerosol. And one of the interesting things about coastal aerosol is it allows us to see kind of through clouds uh, a little bit more easily than um, red, green, blue is obviously obstructed uh, by clouds. So that's an issue with satellites. Um, keep in mind, satellites are, are cameras way above, so when they kind of point straight down, uh, and whatever's blocking their way, that's a problem. And you can't just say, wait, or you know, you have to wait for the, the satellite to come back around uh, to that area before you can take another picture. And if there's inclement weather for months, like there might be in, in Ukraine in, in, in the winter, and you're trying to take pictures, that can be a real problem, right? Like, no, it doesn't matter, really. Um, there's not much you can do, um, except maybe send a drone instead of a uh, request a satellite. Um, but after red, we have a, num a variety of types of vegetation bandwidth, um, and then we have the near infrared, and then we have uh, just 
uh, infrared, uh, various uh, categories of infrared afterwards. Um, and this is planet.com. This is uh, this is a source of data that um, I think you might see a lot if you look at in, in within OSINT, right? Like if you if you follow Bellingcat, if you follow uh, a lot of uh, media organizations that use satellite imagery, you'll hear about Planet.com. And one of the reasons why is because they have really good partnerships with media organizations or human rights organizations that are trying to do good. Like this is sort of you know work for good. And so that they like if you if you write to them and say I'm trying to solve this problem, can you please give me some images? They will, um, I I as long as you fall within a certain category, right? So they're, they're a pretty good company to work with. Um, lots of direct communication and hands-on help, so it's, that's really cool. And they have a, a variety of programs of satellites, some medium resolution, but also higher resolution. Their medium resolution is their planet scope, and then their higher resolution is their SkySat um, series of, of satellites. So I, I mentioned I was going to talk about satellite uh, resolution. I think this gives a, a better idea of what, what we mean by that, right? So if we're trying to measure little green men, then obviously at the bottom, we, on right, you know, we have older satellites taking these 250 meter resolution. That means that every pixel in the image is, represents an area of 250 meters squared, right? So you can imagine that if you're trying to measure something that's smaller than that, you're not going to see it, right? What you get is this sort of average value for whatever it's measuring. Um, 30 meters, still not good enough for little green men or tanks or any type of small thing like a car or whatever. Um, 10 meters, you start to see things, right? That's, that's already that's starting to be good. One meter is good. Um, Planet, their high res, it's it's approximately you know these vary because it's a they during the post process you might lose some some resolution but it's approximately 50 centimeters per pixel right um, if you look at skyfi.com a new service that was released recently that opened up recently to the public where you can just pay at reasonable prices for sending out a satellite or requesting archival satellite imagery then then you can get also approximately 50 centimeter resolution satellite imagery. And, and that's, that's usually kind of more often than not what you're going to want if you're trying to measure things detail. Like anything, like think about it, like what, what's the size of a car? Maybe if, like two, three meters in length? So you think like if you're looking at a resolution of three meters, seems reasonable, seems pretty good, but anything smaller than that, you're not going to see the detail, right? You're not going to see it. So y at that point, it depends on what your question is that you're trying to answer. If you're trying to answer, um, like, you know, is what was the type of weapon that was being used, you're going to need something smaller than three meters, for sure. Um, some satellite sources, I've already mentioned these, but I just wanted to kind of just put them up. Do you, I mean, the resolution thing, uh, it works with visual images, but uh, for infrared, maybe you, can't you have something related to temperature? There are temperature uh, sensors on satellites. Not all of them have it. Okay. For example, uh, I think uh, Sentinel has them, Landsat has it, um, Planet, uh, so Planet's uh, Skysats, they, I think, you, you, I don't think they have that. Okay. I, I'm pretty sure they don't. So you kind of have to research that. Like if you're interested in measuring temperature over a region, then you're going to have to select the correct one. Usually th at that point, high resolution isn't always required, right? When we're looking at things like that. So you can use Sentinel-2 data, choose the right bandwidth. It's usually this is, we're talking about the infrared spectrum, right? And we can, use the, we can measure uh, temperature across uh, an area and see how that changes over time. So yeah, these are just just some general like sources. Um, I, we've used Sky SkyFi recently just to test it out. It's as a platform. It's just you don't have you just log, create an account, set up your credit card. You can order them. The cool thing is is you can send out. Uh, you can tell a satellite. You can tell the order the satellite to go out to a particular place and take a new picture that, that doesn't yet exist. 
Um, that's called tasking. Uh, and you can task a satellite with SkyFi's platform very easily. Y I think the cost is, what, 150 bucks or something around the, right? That, that may seem like a lot to you, but like if you, if you worked with satellite imagery in the past, that it seems like it's super cheap, it's peanuts. Um, these days, because of the competition, because the, uh, of the, the increase in, in better technologies for cheaper, like these small cube satellites that are being sent out, um, the p more actors or agents are able to come into the market, create these, come up with systems and platforms as a service, and bring the cost down. And that's been very good for journalism, it's been very good for researchers, uh, because traditionally getting access we're, is getting access to good satellite imagery is just waiting for Google to add it to their Google Earth program, right? <laughs> which is, which now you don't have to wait. You know, you just, if it's important to you, you can just shell out a little bit of cash and get what you need right when you need it. Um, okay. So here we are. We're gonna start our, our workshop. Um, so we're, the idea really is we're going to take, take that information and we're going to apply it to the the image so th in the sample data there is a folder called sat image and we're going to use that as the sample it's pretty small so it, it shouldn't take up a lot of memory or anything like that everyone should be able to load it um, and the idea here is we're just going to get a feel for how like the process of using satellite imagery and also the different bands to to see where, what vegetation there exists within the image, and how can we take that and turn it into something that we might want to use, um, and then we'll generalize that, right? Because it's, if you can do this with, with uh, using, let's say, a vegetation index, um, you can do it with a lot of other um, types of questions that you want, right? So this is just a taste of using it with the most common, of the, at least until now, usually the most common, uh, uh, sort of method of measuring vegetation, um, and then we'll, we'll, we'll go further. So the most common me method of vegeta uh, measuring ve vegetation is the NDVI, the Normalized Difference Vegetation Index. Um, and you will see this, w if you start looking at you know, measuring green space, measuring trees, or deforestation, this will come up a lot. Uh, and it's, it's a tried and true methodology, it's a tried and true formula, and basically what this does is you take the near infrared band, and you subtract the red band. And then you, underneath, you take the near infrared band and you add the red band, and then you divide the top from the bottom, and you get a new value that is normalized. That's why it's called the Normalized Difference Vegetation Index. And what that's gonna give you is a value between negative one and one, right? It's normalized within that, that frame. Um, and Usually, how we interpret that is from negative one to zero, that's usually interpreted as usually it's water, right? It's, it's definitely not vegetation, but usually it's interpreted as water. And so most, like if you look at the, the USGS or, or other, they, their, their method of visualizing that is blue. Uh, we're not gonna do that today, we're just gonna use two colors and then create a spectrum between those two colors but you can think of it like that. Um, zero is no vegetation, and one is definitely vegetation, right? And why is that? It's, it's because red, red uh, is absorbed by, by, uh, by vegetation, or, uh, yeah. Um, I, I kind of mix these up from time to time. Again, I'm not, I'm not, a, I'm not an expert in this, but I, I am, uh, familiar with using these methods to, to solve specific problems for journalism and research. So if we get too far off topic, I may not be able to answer a question um, to your satisfaction, but I will try and tell you when I don't know. Um, so here is the, on the left side, we have a true color image. A true color image is what we think of when we take a picture with a normal camera. So it's the blue, green, and red uh, values that are detected and then merged into a sort of composite. Um, and that's kind of what we would see with the naked eye, it's what we would see with a camera. On the right hand side, we have what's called a false color image of 
an image that's been already processed uh, where we've, we're, what we're doing is we're visualizing the NDVI or the index here. And so we can see the darker areas is, is not vegetation and the lighter areas is vegetation. Right? Does, that, does that make sense? All right. So here's the plan for this approach. So the question is, is we want to just, for this exercise, what we're going to do together is we're gonna take some satellite imagery. And what we're gonna do is we're going to give it some context. So we're gonna give it some geographic context by using another layer. And we'll talk about layers in a second because we're gonna be using the QGIS tool, which is a geographic information system tool that w works in layers. And we, we can utilize and leverage those layers to do different types of analyses. Um, so we're gonna add an open, like an open street map context layer just to position it in the world so we can kind of see where it is. Then what we're gonna do is we're gonna create a polygon layer, which is just a shape of the area that we want to, to deal with, right? So we're gonna zoom in. A lot of this we would normally do outside of this tool maybe or something, but I think these will be good steps just to kind of also get used to the tool, get used to what it's capable of, and so I kind of added a few extra steps in here just, just so we can play around with, with the tool itself. Um, then we have, we're so what we're gonna do is we're gonna create the polygon layer and then create the polygon of the, the park or the block of land that we're interested in. This is gonna be an area of land with it that's in Bishkek uh, in Kyrgyzstan, um, but it could be any area that you're interested in, keep that in mind. Um, what we're gonna do is we're gonna clip or cut or crop, I think you crop the image with the polygon so we only get the size area that we're interested in. Then what we're gonna do is calculate the ND NVDI uh, uh, of the, the raster, uh, the raster being the satellite image, right? So um, when we say raster, we mean pixels, and pixels, satellite imagery comes in pixels. The pixels have bands, different wavelengths, and each pixel has a value of the measurement for that band. Um, the opposite of raster, or in this case satellite imagery, is vector data. Vector data is used shapes, like a polygon, a point, or a line, um, and those we can, you know, those have, are mathematically defined, um, and also can attach a lot of metadata, uh, such as different values, such as, uh, the, the index or other types of data that we want to to those value, to those polygons or those shapes, or it, as we talk about in, in QGIS, we call them features. Then what we're gonna do is we're gonna use some zonal statistics processing tool, which is a tool that's built into QGIS, which does a lot of the heavy lifting for us. So I remember doing this a few years ago and I didn't realize that there was that tool and I had to go through this very convoluted way of getting from the satellite imagery pixels to points, to m attaching those points to the areas I was interested in and calculating the statistical, like the average uh, for each of those regions. And that was a real pain in the butt. Um, and now like I found this, there is a built-in tool called Zonal Statistics, so which will do it right away. Basically what it says is, is I have this polygon layer uh, and I want to uh, so let's say we create a grid of hexagons over the area we're interested in, and I want to take the values of the pixels and create different statistic averages and apply that to the, the different hexagons, right? The different areas that I'm interested in. Uh, and then we can visualize that. Uh, and so that's what we're going to do here, is we're gonna use the zonal statistics processing tool uh, to calculate that, and then we're gonna do the fun visualization of the grid so that we can see where the green space is and maybe even generate something that we would want to publish uh, on our blog or on our, in our story, et cetera. Does that make sense? Are we all ready to go? All right. Okay, um, so for starters, you know, why are we using QGIS or QGIS? You can say both. Uh, open source, free, has a very large community of users and contributors, which is really nice. Um, it's, it's, has a, it's very actively developed. Um, it's powerful, flexible, and extensible. It it's uses the, if you're familiar, the QDAL, or sorry, GDAL um, set of tools that are written in 
see, and they're the sort of like standard tools that are used in geographic processing on all systems. Um, it's flexible and extensible. Uh, um, a lot of the scripts in, uh, that are built on top of it are written in Python. Um, and the downsides are it has a complex user interface. Um, and so it's a little bit of steep. You have to get used to it and play with it because otherwise it can be quite scary at first. Um, so it has a pretty steep learning curve in terms of the complex UI. And it just has so many features. It can get in the way of itself, right? Like it's not, it tries to do, this is a tool that can do almost anything. So in, in that way, it, it kind of, like if you're new to it, you just don't know where to start. And so we're gonna start slow and simple. All right, I think, I think that's, that's it for now. This was just a note, I think I mentioned this earlier. So let's, let's, um, let's uh, start QGIS. All right, so here's QGIS. It's, um, if you're familiar with like Microsoft tools, like we have the, the toolbars at the top. Um, so we have the menu at the top, we have the toolbars here. We can, there's a lot here, we're not gonna use all of it. So we can, in theory, we can go into the view and start turn, go down to toolbars and start turning some of these things off. I'm not going to do that right now, but um, here we have what's called the, the browser. This is how we interf QGIS interfaces either with your system or how it can interface with a database or any other sources. Um, but QGIS, like any geographic information system, you might, if you're familiar with a commercial system such as ArcGIS or ArcGIS, that, that's a, a tool that is designed to do something very similar uh, it just costs a lot of money. So if you're, if you're getting into this, you might not want to start with that, but it is, what, it is a sort of com professional industry standard um, if you're going to go in that area. Uh, it's just, I think, a license, like a basic license is like something like $4,000. Uh, <laughs> so that was just beyond my means. Um, here we have the layers, and, and basically how geographic information systems work is they work in these layers, right? So you have like a base layer, and then you might have a layer of uh, shapes that represent the area of uh, farms growing different types of crops. And each of those shapes has metadata like wheat, you know, tomatoes, or whatever, you know. And so you get, um, and then we have also what are called, you could have watersheds. Watersheds are the sort of where the water flows, where it doesn't flow, how the water behaves when you have rains or floods. Um, how the water fl comes uh, between winter and spring when it when the water drains, right? That's what what and so you might have a, a sort of geographer or somebody who works in um, geographic analysis detect changes in how the watershed is 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 changing maybe due to soil erosion, um, and so you would use several layers and see how that might affect crops, right? So you have this layer of crops, you have this layer of watershed, you have this layer of uh, other types of information, maybe like even human, human settlements, and you want to sort of analyze, analyze, analyze you know, where, where things overlap. For example, where, wh where's the soil erosion? Where's the water coming from? How is that affecting the crops? What does that mean for, let's say, um, the food supply for this local population, right? So that, that's just one example, but you could use it for a lot of different things. So wh basically what we're gonna do is we're gonna start by adding layers. Um, the first layer that I want to add is that satellite image that I shared with you. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go up into the top menu and I'm going to click on layer. And I'm going to click add layer. And then I'm going to click add raster layer. Keep in mind that uh, QGIS can handle uh, both raster and vector data. Um, satellite imagery is raster, meaning it has pixels, and that's what we're interested in. So we're gonna click on add raster layer, and then we're gonna go in and choose where this is. So I have it in my documents, sorry, not documents. I have it in my temp folder, and then I have it under the heck, then data, sat image, and I'm just gonna choose the one from 2016. 
All right, well, let's keep it simple. Um, the idea was originally that I was going to compare 2016 and 2023, but I think that's, that's well beyond the scope of this workshop. So let's just keep it to looking at 2016. So we're going to open it, and it's going to give us this choice. Okay, so we've chosen the file to open. Let's just go ahead and click Add, and then we're going to close this window. And here we go. Let's, we can go up to the top and click on this uh, plus button to, uh, sorry, the minus button to zoom out. So I'm going to just click on this minus, this magnifier icon. And then I'm going to click on the image. It's going to zoom us out. And you can see we don't know, really know where we are, right? Like we know this is situated somewhere, but it's not quite clear. And so I think oftentimes what we want to do is add another layer, a base layer, that sort of situates the satellite scene or image that we're looking at. All right. So one way we can do that is within our tools, we can add a, a, what's called a tile layer. And it's kind of like the slippy maps that you see on Google or OpenStreetMap. And we're going to use the OpenStreetMap tiles. All right. So we're going to go to the XYZ tiles. And we're going to see that there's an OpenStreetMap option. And what we're going to do is we're going to pull that down to our layers. All right. So what's interesting here is this, we don't see our park anymore. And that's because these layers, they, they start from top to bottom. O order matters. So what's on top is going to cover what's underneath. So what we want to do is just actually pull this down underneath. And now, we've situ now we can see the satellite image, and we can see that over where it's located on the OpenStreetMap. So if we want to zoom out further, we can see where, where this is. And this is, this is the city of Bishkek, which is the capital of Kyrgyzstan. All right. I'm going to click on the plus magnifier so we can zoom in. I can actually just drag and drop over the area, and that's going to expand to the extent of the view screen. Is it, are we OK? Is, is that okay, cool. All right, so here we are. Um, I didn't say, I think this image looks a little funny. And I, let's, let's open up or expand this image. And we can see um, here the, the top band says blue, but it's next to the red, right? And this is a, this is a common problem because, um, because we, it's often we need to correct that. Different sources of satellite imagery order the bands sometimes in different orders. And so we need to be aware of that. And so sometimes you might say like, okay, I need to look up what, is, what are the bands uh, definitions for satellite from planet.com? What are the band definitions from Landsat or Sentinel-2? And then you can, what we're gonna do is we're gonna change how this is represented. So we're gonna double click on this layer. I'm gonna double click. And this is gonna open up a properties uh, window, and we're going to look at this the section called symbology, and this is where we're going to do this is this is how we tell QGIS or QGIS to render or represent the data that it's that it that we're looking at, and we can see here that um, if we down if we click on this red band, we get several options, and we can see that while we're only looking at three bands, there are actually four bands to choose from because. This, this satellite imagery comes from planet, and this, this particular imagery has four bands of data. It has the blue spectrum, the green spectrum, the red spectrum, and the near-infrared spectrum. Now keep in mind, we need the red and the near-infrared to calculate the vegetation index. So that's what we're going to, but for now we want to look at this, how it should be represented optically. So looking at, so we want to tell QGIS that the first band is the, Band three, so it's the red one. We keep green because that's in the middle and it stays. And this, the last one is the blue, and that's band one. So I'm going to click OK. And that's going to change this a little bit, but you can see it, it already looks a little bit better. Sometimes you can't tell, but it will look a little off. And you need to, when something looks a little off, you need to just double check that. Because um, if you get it wrong, it can lead to some uh, bad consequences or bad conclusions that you draw from the information. You don't want to do that. So it's always better to just check and make sure that you, you are working with the right bands in the right order, and, and then you'll be good to go. So here we are. This is the right 
true color representation of this part if we were to go on top of it and take it with a normal camera or look at it with our eyeballs. Um, are we good? All right. All right. So, so now we, what we've done is we've, we've imported two layers. One is this context layer, this OpenStreetMap layer, and then the other is our satellite imagery layer. So let's go back actually real quick and look at our plan. So we've added the raster layer, we've added the OpenStreetMap context layer for context, and now what I wanna do is, what I'm interested in here is this area, this block. We can see it's kind of, it's deli uh, delimited by these roads here. And so what I'm going to do is I want to crop that out. And the way we crop things, uh, images in QGIS, is we need to have a polygon in the shape of what we want to crop out, and then what we're gonna use is a clip function, which will take a, a raster image, a raster layer, and, all, and then remove all the other pixels uh, and create a new layer with just the area of the polygon that we're interested in. So let's go ahead and do that. We're gonna go back up to layers. You can see we'll, we'll use layers quite a lot. Um, we're gonna do is, we're not adding an existing layer this time, we're gonna create a layer. Um, and what we wanna do is we're gonna use the geo package layer. Now in the past you may have been familiar with shapefiles uh, and, and other types of geographic formats, but uh, the geo package layer actually is a little bit, I would say, better, and it's recommended to use moving forward because it doesn't suffer from a lot of the limitations uh, and complexity that shapefiles suffer from, which how many of you have worked with shapefiles in the past? It, they can get a little complicated, right? Like, so I recommend using the geo package uh, format for, for, for these types of things. So we're gonna add a new geo package layer. And before we give it a title, I just wanna say, like we just need to tell it what type of data it's going to have. And w like we said, we want it to be a polygon, but you can have a point, a line, a polygon, or a, a combination of, a complex combination of, of different types of shapes. Um, let's keep it simple. You can only have one type though per layer. In this case, we're gonna have polygon. So let's just choose polygon and we're gonna give it a good name. So I wanna call this uh, uh, park clipped by polygon. Now I'm gonna, I actually have to change where this is being saved uh, because it won't, by default it tries to s store it where it can't write. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna put it in my temp folder with my other data. Um, now let's give it a name. I'm gonna call it the table name the same, park clipped by polygon. All right. Um, and the rest should be fine. Let's, let's not make this overly, oh, well let's give, so what we're gonna be adding are polygons and so let's give the polygons a name uh, so that we can uh, recognize what they are. Um, and the max length of the name, let's say, is 255 characters. Um, let's add that, and then we're good, right? So basically, every polygon can have multiple different types of fields or data tied to it, just like a spreadsheet would have columns. Um, and so we can add more and more different types of data that we want to measure and associate with each shape that we're gonna add. We're gonna keep it simple and just give it a name. But like, if you wanted, you could add, um, uh, rainfall per area or whatever it is that you're trying to measure. So let's hit OK. Um, and now we can see in our layers section, we have uh, a new layer called part clipped by polygon. So I'm gonna zoom in a little bit because I want to measure this area. And so what we need to first do before we start, so we're gonna click on the layer that we want to use. So we're gonna click on that new vector layer, the polygon layer. And what we're gonna go up and we're gonna click on this little pencil icon. That's, that's gonna say, we want to edit this layer. All right, so now we're in edit mode. And then what we're gonna do is we're gonna click on this other field called add polygon. And this is gonna be a lot like, uh, if you're familiar with other, like Google Draw or whatever, you know, you just kind of uh, trace the area you want. The main thing though is when you're ready to, when you're finished, you're gonna hold the control key down um, and then click and it's gonna end the polygon and close it. 
right? Because a polygon, the difference between a polygon and a line is a, uh, a polygon, so um, these all things are abstractions of what come before. So we start with a point, a line is a series of points, and a polygon is a bunch of lines that where the beginning and end point uh, are the same. All right, and then you can go from there and make it more abstract and have multiple polygons. But in theory, that's just how it works. Um, so we're going to start here, and we're going to draw this line to here. Then we're just going to draw it down here, like let's say here. And we're going to draw to this corner here where that street is. And then I'm going to hit Control and click. And then it's going to ask for the field name, because we said we need to give it a name. So I'm going to call this Park. A one, and there we go. Right. So now we have this polygon, and now I'm going to turn off edit because we're done editing this layer, and it's going to ask us if we want to save, and we're going to say yeah, we're done. Right. So it, one thing we can do is that we can click on this little I button, this information button, and we can cl then click on a feature, in this case this polygon, and it's going to show us all the different information that's tied to that particular feature, that polygon. And that can be really useful, and we'll look at that down the road when, we're, when we uh, create the new hexagon grid and apply the, um, the, st the average uh, 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 ind NDVI, uh, in the index value to those, those, grid, those grid features. All right, so let's close this. So the next step we want to do is we want to crop this satellite image to the size of this polygon that we're interested in. And that is really straightforward. So what we're going to do is we're going to go into raster. So here we have vector. And if we're working with vector features, we would choose vector. But what we're, we're interested is we're cropping the, the satellite image. So we're cropping the raster image. So we're going to click on raster. And we're going to go down to extraction. Sorry, I keep looking there when I, it's right in front of me. Um, and then what we're going to do is we're going to clip raster by mask layer. Uh, mask layer just means what are we going to use to, to, what is the shape we want to crop it by? What is, what is masking? What are we masking? And so we're going to use clip raster by mask layer. If we have an arbitrary set of points that we want to clip by, we can choose the first one. But in this case, we were going to use the polygon that we created. And it's going to give us this nice, easy to read menu. And this says, what's the input layer? Well, the input layer is, of course, it's the satellite image, right? It's the raster. So we're going to clip, uh, we're going to choose that. And then what is the mask layer? Well, we only have one vector layer. So it's going to automatically pre-choose that for us. Right? The rest we can actually keep. Um, let's go ahead. Uh, and we're going to actually scroll down. And we're going to tell it to save as a specific file. So where are we there? So we're going to actually tell it to save as a permanent file. We're going to go back to where we're storing all our information in this temp folder. You can store it wherever you want. Just don't forget where you keep these. Um, so we're going to keep it here. And I'm going to call it um, uh, cropped park image or cropped park, let's just keep it simple, cropped park, and let's save it, and then run it. All right, it's always good when we don't get errors. Okay, so let's, let's play around with these layers now. Now we have um, enough layers where we can like, start to get a sense of how they work. If we unclick the first one, and then unclip the polygon, and then what we're going to do is unclip the park, um, and we still have... Where's the polygon? Sorry. Can I ask a question? Of course. Yeah. Uh, how do you make it like uh, uh, like still the polygon? Like because me it's still, uh, I don't know. Uh, so how do you close the polygon, right? Is that the question? Yeah, so it's, uh, it's not uh, like this. Um, let's go back real quick. Um, when you say it's not still, you mean? Ah, OK. So when we, let's do that together one time, and then I'll delete the feature as well. So let's go back to our layer. 
that we're interested in. And what we're going to do is we're going to create, we're going to click edit, and we're going to create a new polygon. And we're going to just start, sorry. We're going to click create new polygon feature, and we're going to start clicking. Now, we can create as complicated a shape as we want, but when we're done, we're going to hold down the control key. OK. If you're not using a Mac, then right click to close the polygon. Did that work? Score. All right. Um, I'm going to hold down the control key, and we can see it's, it worked. Um, apparently, if you're not using a Mac, right click, and it will close the polygon for you. Thank you for that. OK, cool. All right. You may want to redo it if it's uh, too messy now. Um, I'm going to cancel this, though. I'm going to close, turn off edit again. Um, OK, let's see what's going on. All right, so I've turned off all my layers. And now we can, let's, let's return on the OpenStreetMap layer at the bottom. So we can turn the layers, we can, then what we're, we're not removing them, right? What we're doing is we're just making them visible or invisible, right? So we're, so like, we can turn the layers on and off. And this can be quite useful as we're analyzing, but also as we're, we're developing our, our method or approach, and just to kind of see what we've done. So like before we had this park, and if we turn that off and we go to the top, now we have this one, right? So these are different layers now. And we can, we can turn them on and off as we need them, right? So we don't have to keep it all cluttered, everything visible all the time, but we can, only, we can just choose what we're interested at the particular time and make that visible. Um, all right, cool. So we're not going to need this park layer anymore, so I'm just going to keep it turned off. What we're interested in is this, this layer here. All right. So here's where we're going to do something together, and I hope the internet gods thank us a little bit, is what we're going to do is we're going to install a plugin together. Because I want to kind of show you, one, we need the plugin to do this, but two, um, I want to show you how extensible QGIS is. So we're going to click on plugins at the top. And then what we're going to do is do manage and install plugins. Now, the plugin that we're going to install is just a small little thing. So it's not, it shouldn't be too difficult. But what we're going to install is MMQGIS. I already have it installed, but you click on it. And here I can uninstall it. Or if it wasn't installed, I could click install and install it. It should be quite small, right? It shouldn't take up a lot of bandwidth. Um, and once that's installed, you will get a new menu item at the top called MMGIS. Can people raise your hand when you've gotten that far and that you've succeeded? All right, cool. All right. Now, the reason why we're going to do this, and I, I think I left this out of my list of things to do, is what I'm, I am going to add a new step, and I'm going to call this create hexagonal grid. OK. Um, one good habit that you should get into as you do this work. Now, this is just a demonstration. We're doing it together. But if this were real work that you were doing, you would want to create a sort of log file. And as you do each step, you want to document each step that you perform on your data in the order that you do it and why you did that. Um, because in, trust me, in two months, you're not going to remember. In five years, you're definitely not going to remember. And when somebody comes and sues you because you published a story based off data analysis and you're, you're, you know, you're forced to retrieve or, or resurrect what you did and explain how you did it and why, that's going to be the difference between a good day and a very bad day. Um, so definitely, as you work on geographic information or any type of research, right? Like um, Nico Deccans earlier this morning, he gave a talk on like the sort of mindset uh, for OSINT. And the, the documentation stage, of course, is incredibly important. So just, just tacking that on uh, to this presentation. 
Um, so what we want to do, so the end goal is we're going to have this kind of like hexagonal area density of these average values within the, those areas. Um, and so what we want to do is create a hexagonal grid uh, for this area. So if we go to MMQGIS, what we're going to do is we're going to click on create. And then what we're going to do is create uh, a grid layer. And that's a way to just create repeating polygons across the area that you're interested in, each one being a regular polygon, right? Where all the sides are going to be the same and each shape is going to be exactly the same. Uh, so what we're going to do is we're going to choose hexagons. Um, and the layer that we're going to do this with, we're going to choose a uh, layer extent. Sorry. No. Why isn't this working? There we go. Okay, hexagons. We're going to choose where we want to save this. Again, I'm going to save it in the temp folder that I've been maintaining. And normally, I would be able to choose this which layer, and it's not allowing me to choose. Am I doing something? No. Well, let's just try and see, okay. That's not what I wanted to do. So what, actually this is a good example, right? Like I have a layer now that is, I'm not happy with. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna select a layer and then I'm going to right click or control click. It depends on if, you, if it's a Mac, try to use control. If it's a non-Mac, try to use right click. What we're gonna do is we're gonna click on it and we're gonna use remove layer. All right, and there it's gone. It's gone, and it's gone, um, yeah. Now it's gone from QGIS, but keep in mind if you save that layer to file, to disk, um, you removed it from here, but if we go to our temp folder, uh, it's, it's going to be here. That's the file that we just created with the hexagons. So I'm actually gonna delete that too, because I just don't wanna clutter my workspace. But just keep in mind, just because you remove the r visual rendering of the data in QGIS, the file, if you wrote it to disk, will still be there. It's not destroyed. Um, okay, let's try that again. We're gonna go to MMQGIS. We're gonna do create. We're gonna create, um, actually, let me try clicking on the thing. Okay, we're gonna do create. Create grid layer. Okay, it looks like we're just gonna have to run with this see where it goes. Um, I'm gonna change the output file name to be hexagons um, so that I can remember that. And we're just gonna apply it. Okay. One thing we can do that might be a little bit better is I think what we, we can do is we can take these hexagons and we can click on, if there's a vector and we can go down to research tools and we can do is select by location. And here we can say we wanna select the hexagons but we want to compare it with the part clipped polygon and we wanna use the intersect uh, option. We want to only show the hexagons where they intersect with the raster uh, data underneath. So let's click run and I think there we go. And let's see, okay. Well, and then what we can do, let's just leave it at that actually. I think it's getting confusing and I don't, it's not important because what we're gonna do is we're gonna represent the raster data in the hexagons and then where there's no data, we're just gonna make them uh, transparent. So it's actu actually not gonna impact our thing. But if we were gonna do this for reals, we would, um, we would remove all the, the, the non-selected uh, polygons here uh, just to, to clean it up a little bit because it's just clutter, right? It's extra data, it's extra information that we don't want. But this is not important for us. 
So here what's important now is we have these hexagons and then we have our raster data. So if I click, if I make this, if I turn this layer off, we can see we have the, the satellite image and the satellite image has all the data. So if I click on the information button and I click somewhere on the, on the, the pixels, we can see here um, we have, this is all the, the pixel data. What we wanna do now is we wanna create a new layer based off this uh, satellite image that uses the index. And if we remember what the formula for the index is, does anyone? It's near infrared minus red over near infrared plus red, right? And that gives us this, this normalized difference vegetation index. Um, from negative one to one. So that's what we're gonna do here. We're gonna click on this cropped park uh, raster uh, layer. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna click on the raster uh, menu item at the top. And what we're gonna do is, is, is choose the raster calculator. And what the raster calculator allows us to do is, is do calculations on uh, the different bands uh, within that particular layer. And so here we have a couple raster layers. We're only interested in the cropped one that we just created. So let's think about what we're doing here. We're gonna do something divided by something, right? Uh, and then the first one is we're gonna subtract something, and then the other one is we're going to add it. And the first part of our equation or expression is we're going to take the so if we remember, the near infrared was the fourth band. So we're gonna select the fourth band and double click. And then we're gonna put our cursor after the minus. So we can say we want to subtract the red band. And then the denominator of our equation or expression, we're going to choose, again, the same near infrared band, the four, band four. And we're gonna add that with the red band. All right, so that looks like a valid expression and Q just also thinks so. There's a little thing that says, hey, there's no errors here. That's always a good sign. Um, and so what we're going to do is we're going to give this, we're gonna save this to a file. We're gonna save it to the same place in our temp folder or my temp folder. I'm gonna call this uh, in uh, DVI. Um, I'm just gonna call it in DVI. And I'm gonna click save, and then everything else looks correct. So we're just gonna create this new layer based off the other satellite layer, right? The vector, the raster layer, um, where we, but we're gonna regenerate the pixels based off this expression, this formula, right? This, this index uh, expression. All right. And so now we have another layer here. It's in DVI. Um, and we can turn off our cropped park layer because we don't need that anymore. What we're interested in is the index layer. And here we go. Now, let's play around with this, right? Like, I mean, this, here we can see, like, if we click on the, the, the information icon and just click here, we can start to see that there's, an, there's just one band in this new satellite image, right? In this new raster image. And this, this, this band has a value. Right, so I clicked here and there's a value of negative 0 0.049 or like 0 0.05, right? Right, w do we remember what that means if it's, if it's below zero? We usually say it's like water, but definitely it's not trees, it's not bushes, it's not grass, right? It's, 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 uh, it's, it's not vegetation, all right? If it's above zero and closer to one, then it would represent, in th ideally, vegetation. And that's kind of what we wanna see. But, so let's take a look at, the, right now we just have white and we have black. In this case, the white is the one, and the lower spectrum, the black, is, is the negative one. And this itself, as long as we understand that, that makes sense. But if we wanna make it a little bit like more colorful, we can double click on this layer like we did before, and click on the symbology level, 
And what we're going to do is we're going to give it, tell QGIS to take that data and render it or display it based off a new set of rules that we give it. So what we're going to do is we're going to choose the render type, and we're going to choose single band pseudo color. Pseudo means like false color, right, or fake color. We're just going to give it some, uh, some rules to base this on. So we're going to choose single band pseudo color. And by default, uh, it, it's going to choose the last thing I chose, which is this color ramp. And that's the one we're going to use. But if you click on this, this arrow next to it, we can choose a variety of other types of patterns that we want. Or we can make some, cu some custom ones. But we're going to keep it super simple. We're just going to choose. I'm going to choose this one. You choose the colors you want. What is important is that you remember that on the lower end, we have the dark blue, and then the right end, we have the yellow. Another way we can do this, uh, we'll, we'll look at a different way to do this later when we, when we merge this information with the hexagons. Um, but in this case, this is going to give us this, this range. And then we can see here that what QGIS does is it says, OK, we're going to divide this up into a series of values. And for each of these values, we're going to associate it with a color um, definition. Are we all on the same page here? So we're just going to let Q just do the heavy work by just saying single band pseudo color. And then whatever the value is, so this says there's only one band, right? Band one. So whatever the value is for that band, um, which is the index, we're going to, if it's negative one, we're going to make it dark blue. And if it's positive one, it's going to be a very vibrant yellow, right? So let's go ahead and click OK. And there we go. We can see that the yellow is going to tend to represent more where there's more vegetation. And where it's not yellow or it's darker blue, um, there's less vegetation or no vegetation, actually, right? Um, now, think you can do this with a lot of uh, any type of imagery you want. And what's interesting about this particular example that I chose is that it's actually really hard to tell with your eye by looking at the image where there is and isn't vegetation. But we can use the near infrared band uh, and the, the, the index to, to allow the data to tell us where it is in this case. And that, that's kind of the beauty of, of this, this imagery, but also the, of remote sensing um, uh, with these different bandwidths that we can't see with our eyes. Um, but now we're going to kick it up a notch. We're going to take this to another step. Uh, and we're going to continue to explore QGIS. But we're going to do, we're going to take the same data, and what we're going to do is we're going to say, we're going to apply wherever these pixels are, um, wherever these pixels overlap with these hexagons, within the hexagon, we're going to take all those pixels, and we're going to take the index value. We're going to do an average, a mean, or a series of statistical like aggregations. And what we're going to do is we're going to add that value to the hexagon. Does that make sense? Is that, did I explain that OK? Yeah? OK, cool. That's sometimes I get, I'm, I'm bad at explaining that particular part. So this is actually where I, when I first did this, I, was, I, I did it in an incredibly convoluted way, a, a complicated way. And it turns out that there's a very easy way to do this. Um, the easy way to do this is what we're going to do is we're going to go over to this processing toolbox on the right. Now, if you don't see the processing toolbox, that's OK. What we're going to do is we're going to look in the menu at the top. There's a View button. We're going to scroll down, and there's a se section called Panels. And this is how we can choose what is visible in our QGIS tool layout. And what we're going to do is we're going to make sure that the Processing Toolbox panel is selected. So if you don't have it, that's fine. Um, it, it's, not, it's not missing. It's just not visible, and we're going to select it. So what we're going to do in the, the processing toolbox um, is we're going to type, we're going to search for it. We're going to type zonal. Um, and we can see here there's an option called zonal statistics. And that's exactly what we want. And basically what that's going to allow us to do is do these sort of aggregations from a raster layer onto a vector layer um, where they overlap, though. So let's double click on the raster statistics. And I just want to emphasize, this is kind of one of the, the really cool things about QGIS is that 
uh, these are built into the tool and these are very common operations. So you don't have to like write your own Python script to do this. Uh, a lot of the basic stuff um, is really just baked into the tool. Um, people have already done this a million times and they've contributed this, this, these functions so that you can easily use them. So what we're gonna do here in the zonal statistics is we're gonna choose the, in, the input layer. Now the input layer is going to be the park clipped by polygon, right? It's the raster layer, not the hexagon layer. Oh, sorry. I am getting that backwards. We want the hexagon. Uh, and then the raster layer is going to be the NDVI layer, the one that we just created using the raster calculator, right? So that's, we're gonna take these values and what it's gonna do is it's gonna say, give me all the pixels that overlap with the, each hexagon. And within that hexagon, we're gonna do these statistics. Um, now let's go ahead and give it an output. Let's call this NDVI stats and then put a little dash at the end because it's gonna tack on whatever the statistic is um, to the label that we're adding. So here I, I just put uh, NDVI stats underscore and then whatever, if it's gonna be mean, if it's gonna be min, max, range, whatever, that's gonna get tacked onto there. So we're gonna have, for each hexagon, we're gonna have a variety of metadata um, that's associated with each shape and that we can use. So let's choose which statistics we want to calculate from the satellite image, right, that we have. And this is the NDVI one, so we don't have all the other bands, we only have the one, it's the NDVI index. And let's just choose, let's just choose a lot, you know, like why not? Um, let's choose min-max. Uh, range is based off min-max, but we can just go ahead and add it. I think that's good, maybe variance, I think that, that might be useful at some point in the future. I click OK. These are all the stats I want to add. And then I'm gonna, like always, I don't wanna create a temporary file, I wanna save the results to the file and then it's gonna automatically add the layer to my list of layers. So I'm gonna put this new, um, this new layer, I'm gonna save it as hex with NDVI stats. Uh, and I'm gonna save it in my temp folder. All right, I think we're good. Are we all ready for this? Okay, let's, let's run it. All right, it looks like it was successful, so let's close this window. And now nothing's changed, or did it? Well, how do we check? Well, let's zoom in. I'm gonna click on the, the magnifier icon with the plus, and I'm going to then select this information icon and click on one of the hexagons. All right, let's just click on one, see if I can click, there we go. And, oh wait, it, it actually does help if I select the, the new layer that we just created. Um, so now I'm gonna actually unclick these layers. I'll keep the NDVI one. If I unselect that, we can see where they overlap. I'm gonna unclick the NDVI layer and now I'm gonna click on one of the hexagons and we can see now we have all these values that are attributed with just that single hexagon. And that's an aggregate based off the pixels from the satellite image underneath it. And so we have the count, the number of pixels, um, and then uh, the registered, uh, the in, and then the VI score, and then we have a sum. But what I'm interested in really is the mean because I wanna calculate the mean index score for that polygon for each of the polygons, each of the hexagons. Does that make sense why we would do that? Now, the reason why I bring that up is because if we were looking at the forest data that I showed in the story, the OCCRP story from the beginning, that data was binary. If you remember, I mentioned that that was, it was either on or off, right? Like for each year, it was on or off. And in that case, what is important when we do it that way is that we want to know if it's there or if it's not. And if it's there, then what we're interested not in is in not in the mean, but it's in the count, right? We want to know the count of each of those on pixels. Um, but in this case, this isn't an issue of being on or off. It's a contin the index is continuous from negative one to, to one. So we what I wanted to do was take the average of that value. So here we have, so it looks like we've, 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 we've done it, right? Like 
but it's it's not ideal, right? Because this isn't helpful. <laughs> this view, right? Like this is um, this is just a bunch of hexagons. What we want to do is tell QGIS how to render this information so that it, it makes sense. It tells us a story. Um, so I'm just like before. What we're going to do is we're going to take that layer, that new layer, double click on it, and we're going to do the exact same thing we did before, just a little bit different. We're going to change how those values are represented by using uh, w what are categorized values. Um, and we're going to choose the value that we want to categorize. In this case, I'm going to choose mean. But the cool thing is just like we can go and we can like change it after we do this and choose whichever values we want if we have multiple statistics that we want to visualize. But in this case, let's look at the mean. Um, and then the symbol, uh, let's choose the color map. I'm going to just choose one where there are greens because green makes sense. But the thing is, is I don't want it to be white. I, I want the, when there's no green, I want it to be transparent. That's just a visual preference, right? How I want to visualize this information. So if I click on the color ramp itself here, I'm going to get this drop down, and I can choose on the left hand side which is the start color, and then on the right hand side which is the, the, the end side. So I'm going to choose on the left side, I'm going to click the drop down, and I'm going to click transparent. And it's as simple as that. The rest I'm going to leave the way it is, all right? So all we did was we changed. So it, it creates a, 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 what do you call it, um, gradient from one color to another. In this case, what we wanted is the first color to be transparent. And so we click on this arrow, we choose transparent, and then we're good to go. We're going to click OK. Um, and then what we need to do is choose how we want to classify this. And so let's just classify it here. Sometimes we can choose, in this case, how many values we want. But let's just keep it as is. I don't want to make this more complicated. Um, let's click OK. And here we go. Let's remove, I guess this is the issue. Let's see. This is why we need to remove the other ones, but we're not going to do that now for the sake of time. Uh, but I, I, let's just take a look at what we have here and pretend like these other pixels, these other hexagons don't exist. Um, if we, so why is this not transparent? To here? Okay, I'm going to change this to graduated. I'm going to take this, make it transparent. Okay, so we're we're switching from from to graduated uh, as a value. Um, we're going to click OK, and here what we're going to do is choose five classes. All right, let's let's make it a hundred. Okay, let's let's just make it twenty, and we're going to classify. For some reason. Let's move the opacity over. This is becoming more complicated than I want. Let's just leave it at that. The, the, I think we're getting lost in the weeds, and that's not the point. All right, here we go. That is definitely not what we want. And classify. Okay. Okay. We're gonna leave it at that. Um, this is not ideal, uh, but we could see how we've represented this information uh, in a particular way. Um, ideally, what we would see, it's for some reason it's not doing what I wanted to do. This is the curse of live demonstrations. We're going to choose this. We're going to make the stroke color transparent. And OK. 
Okay, any case. Say okay. Okay. So what we've done is we've applied the values of the NDVI score to each of these hexagons. And what we're doing is we're looking at the mean. And the mean then is, is each of these hexagons is representing all the pixels underneath it as a single value, right? This average value. And then we choose the rules by which we want to visualize it. And this is, a, this is different from, let's say, satellite imagery. We can, we can view satellite imagery directly as, as we want here. And this is a good representation of the better representation of the screen of green space. Um, it wasn't, this isn't what ideally what I wanted, but the point is, is that we can transfer that and turn it into a vector for different types of maps, different types of animations or, or, or graphics that we want to show where we, where green space or some other metric, right, d changes over time. Now, each of these points, and I will, before we switch to our last example, which will be quicker, um, is each of these points, each of these hexagons has all this information and we can render that however we want. But um, you, we can also do this, create another layer from 2023, right? So do exactly what we did now for, uh, in, until we get here. And now we have two layers, but we use the same hexagons for both to generate both. And what we can do is we can subtract the values uh, or we can do um, a percent change over time and create a new metric for and apply that to the hexagons. And then we can generate what, we, what would be change in vegetation for each of these hexagons. Does that make sense? Right? Something along those lines, right? And we can do that with any type of metric. So this is an example of working with some basic, like, vet, basic taking a, a generic satellite image with four bands of data, generating this indexed version of it, which has a single band, uh, the, the index, and then working with it to visualize it or to do other types of statistics. Generally, what we can do is we can do a point by point, pixel by pixel comparison and generate a new TIFF or a new, a new uh, raster file that has all that information. But if we want to do something like more interesting heat maps or, or things like that, then chances are we want to get that information into a vector. And the best way to do that really is you don't want to have like a billion points, uh, markers, right, on a map that doesn't work. So that's why we create what's called a, an area density map um, because it, it takes, it aggregates that over a smaller area and then we can, we can like make judgments across the area based on the smaller units, um, but still, um, uh, but slightly abstracted. All right, that's that example. Are there any questions? <laughs> Was that useful? Uh, question? Do you want to use the microphone so it's recorded? I'm sorry. Um, does it make sense to stay in a continuous uh, space? Or should we switch to something like we say minus one to zero, it's zero, uh, zero to zero five, it's something like maybe and? That's a good question. Um, we often do that, we call that bending, right? Bend, we bend the uh, continuous data into uh, discrete uh, ranges. And in this case, we can, we can do that if we want to, right? Um, one of the ways we can do that is now that we have this vectorized in this, this layer is we could um, choose this layer and what we're gonna do is we're gonna click on this, well, we need to edit this. So turn on edit because we're adding values to it and we're gonna click on, instead of the raster calculator, what we would click on is this field calculator. Um, and what we could do then is do something like, now this is for our next example, so I'm, uh, but just to show you how we could do that if we wanted to, if we look at, we could do something like this, where we take the value, in this case, in the next example, we're gonna look at altitude and do just that thing. Uh, but we could, in this case, we would take the NDVI score uh, the, the, and then bin it. So we would choose the rules and we'd create a new field called NDVI bend or bin and then, and then 
visualize it based off those values, right? And th those would be very discrete, and it would be, in theory, easier to work with, right? Because you, you'd say, okay, I only want a range of, we would only need, like, what, 12 colors or something like that, right? So that makes a lot of sense in some cases. In some cases, uh, the range is good, you know? It just depends on what we're trying to do. Both are, are valid approaches, but I think for uh, the end, for a person looking at it, yes. Simplifying it a little bit and making it more discrete, as long as we choose bends that are meaningful for the metric that we're trying to measure, that's an important aspect of that process. All right. And in terms of uh, vegetation, does having a higher NVIDIA score mean something or? It means that there is vegetation, Wait, right? Like, is like there more? Yeah. yeah okay. so, so it means that the, the, f the, the energy that was reflected back to the satellite uh, uh, captured the fact that there was vegetation, right? Whereas like if there's none, like if it's negative one, it just means like there's, it's concrete or, or negative one is water, right? Like you'd measure like the ocean, right? The ocean would probably be somewhere between negative one and maybe a negative 0.5 or something like that or, or zero. Right, so the, yeah, the indi that's why we did that index, right? Because that takes this, whatever, whatever the values are on the satellite image, it allows us to determine where there is vegetation. And, and then also with that score, if we did that on two different years or two different times, we can compare the score and calculate the percent change, right? And that would tell us like, if we only, if we bend it, if we only want to look at, let's say, if we say we can choose based off our knowledge, our experience, our, our context knowledge of about the context of the area we're looking at, we can we can actually choose a threshold that makes sense for our analysis and say, um, within this area, we're only looking at let's say deciduous or or coniferous uh, uh, green, right? Both of these we can actually like narrow down how because there is a slight difference in in bandwidth of of those two types of, of vegetation, and we can measure that and distinguish it uh, from the from the image, right? So. Um, and then transfer that to the NDVI score and then represent that and show, show change or, or just show a snapshot in time or however, whatever our goal is. If our question is oftentimes, and in this case, uh, like with the case with Nicaragua was to say, was there a change in vegetation? Where was that change in vegetation? How much was the change in vegetation? And how did that overlap with indigenous areas? In which case we could take another layer of indigenous areas and we could do like, what is the, di like is there a correlation between this change and this other, the value of is it indigenous or is it not? Right? That's a binary value, but we could do a correlation between those two and see if there's like a positive or negative correlation. In, in that case, it would make a lot of sense. And, and then you get, you, you, can, you can say, well, according to the data, there is a propensity for indigenous land to be deforested. Um, and you can say that with some degree of confidence, right? All right. So, that's, that was a long talk, and I, I thought we would do this an hour and a half total. So now what we're gonna do is take a quick look at um, a different type of data, uh, sh vessel data, uh, and let's just look at a quick story. Oops. All right, so we recently published a story called Below the Radar, how an Indian tycoon's petrochemical empire quietly dodged Iran sanctions. Um, and one of the interesting components of the research within the story was tracking ships. Now, um, here's a, a picture of the, the final published graphic that we used. Uh, and we could see where, the, where we, we could track the ships and then where we couldn't, right? Like where they disappeared. Um, based off a certain type of data, um, and that data is AIS data. And AIS stands for Automatic Identification System. Uh, this, work, this is associated with vessels with ships at sea, but like, we're not gonna get to it today about planes, but there's a, a very analogous type of data called ADSB uh, data that we use, to, and it's very similar in form. And so the approach that we're gonna do with this, this ship data would be the exact same approach you would do with, let's say, flight data. Um, and so what is this data, right? So ships give off, uh, they, they have a transponder, and it's a transmitter, um, and it's also a receiver, 
because they, they get to know where other ships are and then the other ships get to know where they are. Um, but these data points, these signals that get sent out, they are radio signals and they're radio signals that contain information that we can decode, right? And that all we need is an antenna and, and, a, and a small processor to, to process that information. And so you can get these like Raspberry Pi sets or different types of, that obviously the bigger antenna, the wider the range you can capture. But um, what that means is that you get a whole variety of, of pings, right? Each, each ping contains a latitude, longitude, ground speed, uh, direction or orientation, um, and, a, and a variety of other types of, of metrics. Um, and what we're really interested in here is just latitude and longitude for each ping. Also a timestamp, of course, right? Like where it is, um, so where it is and when it was. Um, and where can you get this data? Well, there's a variety of sources. I just put two, but if you type AIS data sources uh, in DuckDuckGo or whatever you use, you can get a sense of where you can access this data. Um, you can get it also from marine, marine traffic is non-free, but if you set up your own antenna at home and contribute to the project, they will give you free access. It's a fun project, it's worth doing, you contribute back and then you get free access, it's a win-win. Um, so uh, definitely worth trying out. The same thing with flight data, right? There's a Open Sky Network uh, has, uh, is a great program and if you set up your own uh, receiver and commit and contribute data, uh, then they will give you free access to their entire database, which is how we can measure, for example, did, did Prigozhin's plane land in, in Minsk or, or did it fly back to Moscow, right? We can, we can start to do these things um, in real time or even look at historical data. But right now, so that was ADSB data that, we're gonna talk, that I just mentioned, but we're gonna focus on, um, we're gonna focus on this AIS data. So let's maybe take a look at it real quick, let's close, I don't know what that is. So let's take, um, oops. Where? Let's make this big. I'm just gonna show you real quick what it kind of looks like and then we can, um, we can go from there. So AIS data comes, usually when you, when you query it, it's in a SQL database or a distributed SQL database or some kind of, or you get it as a CSV file from marine traffic, but in any case, it's tabular data, right? So this is not one of those, G, it's not a, a, a satellite image, right? It's a spreadsheet type file that you can work with. Um, and if we take a look at here, we can look at, for example, this, this file, and I'll just do a quick visualization of it. Um, and it's, it's just a table, right? Like we have the MMSI, which is the kind of code, the unique code, uh, we have the IMO. These are the codes of the ships. It's a unique code tied to a ship. Um, we have the status, we have the speed, we have the latitude and longitude, the course, the heading, et cetera, and the timestamp. What we're interested really is in the timestamp and the latitude and longitude for our purposes. Um, so let's take a look at that. Let's go ahead and uh, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna actually, I'm gonna save this to my temp folder and then I'm gonna remove those layers and then or create a new project. So I'm, Temp, uh, ch -ch -ch, green space, the heck, and save it. All right, so now I'm gonna close this project. And now I'm gonna create a new project. And now what we're gonna do is we're gonna create a new layer from our project um, for this project. We're gonna import we're gonna add a layer, but this layer is not a vector layer. It's not a raster layer, it's not a satellite image. It's gonna be a delimited text layer, right? Delimited text means, um, like a CSV means uh, comma separated values or often called comma delimited values, right? Because the, it's the symbol that separates the different values is a comma. So we're gonna choose a delimited text layer because it, that's what it is. We're gonna choose it. So I'm gonna to go to my temp folder 
and choose in the data folder the AIS file, the CSV file. We're going to open it. And that's not what we want. Here we go. And it's, it detected everything, right? Like it detected that the lawn stands for longitude, Y stands for latitude. Um, it, you know, it gives us a layer name and it says it's a CSV file because it detected the comma. So we're good to go. We're gonna add this. And we're gonna close it. And this is kind of what we get. Now we're in the same situation as we were before, remember with the, the satellite image, we have no context. So let's go ahead and take our OpenStreetMap layer and pull it into the, the project. And again, let's move it down underneath, not on top. And, and now we have a better sense of, of what we're looking at, right? So here we can click on the minus sign and zoom out to kind of see where we're at. All right, there we are. Um, cool. So what, what's kind of important here is we want to, see, we can see here that there's a point over here, and then there's some points here, but then it just kind of stops. And you'll see this a lot when, um, either when there's no transponder, right, to receive the, the, or no antenna to receive the information, that's an option, and don't, don't forget it. Don't just assume that it, it turned off, they turned off their responder. Um, you need to make sure that there actually is no, re no receiver to collect the data in the first place. But in this case, there is, we know there is, um, and so basically what we want to do is we have this, it comes in a series of points, right? Every row in our table is a single point, a latitude and longitude um, with a timestamp. And what we want to do is kind of, we want to start by visualizing this and saying, let's turn this into a series of paths and group them by, let's say, day. We want to know what day, uh, let's look at each section of segment of this path by day to get a sense of how this boat is traveling. So what we can do here is we can, take this layer, and we can go back to our processing toolbox, and what we're gonna do is type points to uh, path, points to path. Because what we're gonna do is we're gonna, we're gonna, it's basically like in SQL you do a group by, right? Like you, you take a series of rows and you group, you group a value by a certain, cer certain value or certain, certain um, column. Uh, that's kind of what we're doing here. So let's click on this points to path, and what we're gonna do is we're gonna take the, the points, the AIS data, and we're gonna say, we, but we need to tell it which order to process the points. This is important. In our case, it, in, in almost every time you're working with data like this, it's gonna be by the, by in order of the timestamp, right? We want it to be temporally in order, in, in sequence. So let's click on um, the, uh, let's see, where were we? timestamp, uh, and then we want to group it, and let's group it by, oh, well, we can't. We can't group it because we don't have a value to group it by, we just have these dates, but the dates are long and they include the time, and we want to group it by date. So actually, let's stop this. This is on purpose, because what we're gonna do is we're gonna create a new field. We're gonna, we're gonna um, click on this, this icon up here, this like, looks like an abacus. Right, and, and basically this is called the field calculator. We're gonna click on that, we're gonna create a new field based off the timestamp, and we're gonna, we're gonna limit it to just the year, the month, and the day, and that will be a sort of category by which we can group, so this is gonna be a string or text, and we're gonna group this path by that day. So let's go ahead and choose an output name, and let's call it date. Let's choose it, it's gonna be a text, um, and then w what we're gonna do is we have some options here, some functions and some data. We're gonna choose the existing fi uh, fields and values. And we're gonna scroll down and we're gonna choose the timestamp. And now we're gonna do something with it. We can see the value at the bottom, there's a preview, but this is a date and we, what we want is a category. So we wanna turn this into a day category. So first of all, what we're gonna do is we're gonna turn it into a string and then we're gonna take the first part of that string um, and crop it, the first 10 characters, to give us the yyyy-mm-dayday, or dd. So let's try that. We're gonna use the function called toString. 
Now, I knew this because I've done this, right? But how, how do you know, if you don't know what the function is, what functions are available? Well, if we go on the right-hand side and we close this one, we can scroll down and see that there's an option called string. And if I open that, it's going to give us a lot of different functions that we can use. And here, one of them is toString, right? But we have a lot of others, and you can explore them. Um, but here we want to string, and when we convert this to string, it's actually going to give us the, 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 the format that we want. Okay, so let's go ahead and do that, and we're going to actually click OK. The output is going to be a new field called date. We determine that up here, and what we're going to do is click OK, and now we have a new field. How do we know that? Well, let's click on the field table. If I click on this table, we can see here that we now have this new column at the end called date, and it's a string, and we can use it as a category to group the points into a path. Are we all on the same page a little bit? Is it, am I going too fast? What? Okay. I generated a new field within the same layer. So this is a CSV. I double click, so this, sorry, not double click. What we're gonna do is we're gonna open up this, what's called the field calculator. And when we, we choose what the output field name is gonna be, it's not gonna be a new layer, it's gonna be a new field. So you're not gonna see it right away, right? Because it's not a layer, it's a field. And when we generate that using this two string function, so, so we choose the value, the column that we're already interested in, in this case, the timestamp, and we're gonna, run a function on that like we would in a spreadsheet, right? And in a spreadsheet, we have lots of functions. We just put the, the value in parentheses, and we, we put the function name before it, and that's going to process that value depending on what the function is, right? Like if it's an Excel, you could say to date, or if it's Google Sheets, you could do filter and then whatever range you want. So here we're just going to do to string, and then when we Whatever we choose the output name, so in this case, let's say date number two, just because we already have a date, I just created one, but this is going to be a new field. So it's not going to show up when I click OK, the output, and how do we know what it's going to look like? Well, we can look at this little preview before we click OK, and it will give us a sense of what it's going to look like before we hit OK. Does that make sense? Yeah? OK. So let's hit OK, and now, now, we don't see a new layer because we didn't add a layer. We added a new column, right? a new field. So if we, how do we know that it happened? Well, we can op click on this little icon at the top that looks like a table. And that's going to be our table view. And if we scroll, look to the right side, we have two columns now, data and data2. Um, but they're the same because we did the same thing. Or data2 didn't, because I didn't choose the right type, which should be text but let's ignore that and let's just use the one we'd created first. Now the, the whole reason why we're doing that is because we can't group by these dates because these dates have time as well. They have minutes and hours, minutes and seconds and that's not what we want to group by because every second, every one that's unique will be its own path and we want to group all the points into a series of paths that are grouped by the day, okay? so. Let's go ahead and do that. Now that we have all the data that we need, we can click on this points to path. So in the processing toolbox, we're gonna click points to path. We're gonna click on, click on that. It's gonna open a window, and then it's gonna ask us some questions. The first one is like, what do we want to order these points by? And we're gonna always choose timestamp. Uh, because if we don't, then it's gonna rearrange the order and it's not gonna make any sense. Um, we're interested in points in time. Uh, now we want to choose how we want to group these points. Well, we want to group them into paths by the day that, that, um, that they belong to. And so that's where we're going to take this value that we just created, and we're going to use that as the group by value. Right. Now let's go ahead and um, let's going to save this to file, the output. This is going to create a new layer when we run this. It's going to create a layer that's not points, but lines, right, paths, um, because we're changing this. We're, we're converting these points into, into lines. So let's, let's go to temp. And let's call this paths. I'm going to call it AIS paths. And I'm going to click save. And then I'm going to run this. 
and let's see what happens. Okay, it didn't error, that's good news. There's no error. Let's close the window. And now we have, it's hard to see, but let's zoom in. And it's hard to see because the color is yellow and it's very light yellow. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna click on this layer, the new AIS pass, and we're gonna change how it's represented using the, the same thing we've done already several times, which is change the symbology settings. So in this case, let's keep it simple. Let's, we want it to be a color that's easily recognizable, so let's just choose red. I'm gonna choose red or pink or whatever that is. And then I'm gonna increase the width of the line here to be uh, seven five is a good number. The rest, let's just leave it as is. And here we go. Now, this is useful, but we can make it a little bit more useful because we can add labels to it. We can add labels that represent the day that, um, of each segment of this path so that we can analyze this path of this vessel. So we're gonna click on this again and go back to our symbology, but underneath symbology, we have a, uh, an option here called labels. If I click on labels, it, by default, it says no labels. We're going to change that to single labels. And then what we're going to do is we're going to choose the value that we want the label to be. In this case, it, it automatically chose date. That's what we want. Um, and then let's maybe go to the text option in these options and let's increase the size to be 20. And let's make it bold. I don't know which is a good one. And then hit OK. Now, the problem here is that these are small segments, and so they're not going to show up. Let's, let's go back in and change that a little bit. Maybe let's, let's just make this smaller. Let's make it 9, 9. All right. And it's not showing up the other dates uh, because this segment is small. It's too small. So what we can do is change in the uh, way it's rendering. So there's a, a section called rendering. And what we can do is change how the text, the labels are rendered. Um, and what we can do is say always render. Um, and that is one of always and always and allow overlaps without penalty and label every part of the multi-feature. All right. And that didn't work either. Okay, so <laughs> there we go. <laughs> um, I'm gonna click on the hand to pan. The hand icon allows us to pan around. Uh, and now we can see the date. So this is, uh, let's zoom in. Give it a sec to render. And this is 2019, 10, 23, and this is 2019, 10, 24. We can see, um, and then we can pan around and start to see. How the vessel traveled in time based off this data. Another thing that I like to do when looking at this data is because it's all the same color is we can change it to being graduated like we did with the hexagons, right? where we double click on the symbology and we choose uh, categorized and let's just use some random colors and let's choose the day, date, and then classify it. So there's three dates and hit okay. And now we've changed the colors. Each day is gonna be a separate color. Now there's three, we see two here, but there's actually one over here. There's this little dot uh, around here it's hard to see if we zoom out. It's like this, this is, this is a dot. And it's just one single point. And you could see probably what happened was is that someone silly, after they turned off their responder, actually turned it on and turned it off. Um, that's just my guess because you have this like orphaned dot as part of the, like that just randomly turns on and somebody had a, like an oh crap moment where they, you know, like, we're doing crime, turn it off, 
you know, type thing. So, um, but that's, that's, I just wanted to give you another way where we can, we can, we can, in QGIS, it's, it's a tool that once you get used to, there's a lot you can, oh, I meant to hit the plus button. The, uh, there's a lot you can do here, right? A lot with this tool. This tool's a little bit overwhelming, but when you get used to working with these layers and, and the different types of information, right, whether it be a, a CSV with different columns of latitude and longitude and timestamps, you can visualize that. If you have satellite data, you can visualize it and process it and ask questions and get answers back. And that was kind of our goal for today, was really just to give you, like, as a, for us to work through it together. And I hope I didn't confuse you too much. Um, this last part, we kind of rushed through it a little bit. But I hope I inspired you that, you know, it sounded like we did a lot, and we did a lot in, an, in an two hours, but think about it. If you spend a bit of time getting used to this, this is something you can do. Um, this is really within your grasp um, to start to process geographic data in this way, to visualize it, and to start to, to ask questions and see how you can visualize it in QGIS uh, so that you can get the answers back that you need for your research, for your, your, your stories, for whatever it is you're working on. So that's, that's it. Thank you. Um, any questions? In general, it can be any question. If I can answer it, I'll try. Um, hello? Okay. Uh, as uh, you did uh, all the layers on the left on uh, one specific data, uh, if I take the example of the uh, precedent one with uh, vegetation, yeah, we got uh, data of uh, 2016, I think, something like that. Uh, could we just uh, in um, uh, update, update just the first layer of the data and take the one of uh, two, uh, two 2020, maybe, and just put in in the in this uh, um, in this sample and just use the same layer and it will update the map and all the data. I don't know if I understand. Uh, if you have just the first, uh, the first data is uh, like the vegetation of uh, the past, and you want to do the same uh, thing that you did with the layers, yep. and you just upload another set of data, ah. is it doing the same thing uh, automatically, or, or you have to do everything again? Ah, OK, automate. Like, yeah. OK, <laughs> that's a good question. Um, so what we did was we did it step by step manually, um, and what's interesting when you do a, 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 in QGIS when you do a thing like let's say points to path, you can actually like a lot of almost every single tool that you use you can do is copy this command as a Python command or copy it as a QGIS command, and what that means is that you can do um, so if you if you if you do it in QGIS and then you want to automate that in a script then you can copy, as you do each of these commands, each, each of these steps, is you can copy the actual Python command, or you can copy the QGIS process command, and then run them in sequence, uh, run them in sequence. Because basically what's happening is each step of the way, you're usually creating a new layer, but if you noticed, as we were creating a new layer each time, we were also saving that layer as a file to disk. And that's what kind of QGIS is doing, is it's actually working on that, that file or that layer, and then creating a new layer and a new file at each step of the way. And so if you think about it, like let's look at this points to path, and if we look at, and we, let's say let's copy, let's copy it as a, a Python command. Well, okay, let's, let's pretend like we didn't do that before. Let's redo these steps. Um, we're gonna group it by, again, by date, which is replicating this, so we can use that as an example. We're gonna order it by timestamp. Okay, now we have, and then we're gonna save it as a file. We're gonna save it as a test dot test, just test, whatever. This is, the point is to look at, um, okay, now we copy that. If we go to my notes, and paste it down below, let's say, oops. Right, 
that's that's what we're running. And so this is processing run. Um, so basically, we can we can do it directly, or you know, we can take each step and do it that way. If you do a lot of this, you'll start to realize that under the hood, a lot of these things are are, are gdal commands or other types of commands, um, or just scripts that you can reference directly. And so if you're familiar with Python, then you can write a series, like just a sequence of steps, and then just save it as a, like a, even a function where you take an initial satellite input file and then sa save the, at the end of the steps uh, a final file, or even at each step of the way just save, save the files in, in sequence. And then you can just point a file, point it the function to a file, and it'll batch process it. And then you could just create a loop around that or whatever it is. I'm not, I'm not saying that's probably the best way. You know, when you work with geographic data, it can get quite big. Satellite imagery can be huge. And so you, you have to also keep that in mind. Like the file that we used as a sample was, in, was quite small. I cropped it to begin with. Um, so, but keep in mind, like, that was a very small area too. When you start to work on, on bigger areas, like if you work with, for example, machine learning algorithms to do object recognition um, within within a geographic area, let's say you're measuring uh, what's come up before was like um, illegal landing fields, right? And you you have you 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 want to the, you train a model to, to to recognize that, and then you run that over an area to see if you can detect automatically things that are probably that thing that you're trying to find you're going to realize you're starting to work with a lot of data, right? A lot, of, it's big. So you're going to have to process it a little bit differently than you would in QGIS, right? You're going to have to start thinking about memory. You're going to have to think about efficiency. You're going to, you're going to have to think about these things a little bit better than, than what we did today. This wasn't supposed to be an exhaustive, you know, like uh, presentation of all the aspects, but I can imagine, like, when you, start, when you start to think about batch processing things, you have to kind of slow down a bit and think, okay, <laughs> What are the edge cases? <laughs> like, what am I working with? Because you can I mean, immediately get an out of memory error very quickly um, with, with satellite imagery. It's, it's just a thing. Um, it, oftentimes what you'll do when you process satellite imagery in bulk or in, at, at scale is you're, you're gonna break down the image into quadrants or smaller subsections and, and then process them like that, like in, 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 in a sort of uh, pattern, right? Instead of processing the whole thing in once, because you, you most you're not you're not going to pay for that much memory. These things can be huge. Well, Eric, thank you very much. <laughs> thank you. Please applause, Eric. <laughs> it was very interesting. You are a good trainer. Seriously, really? it's easy to it's easy to understand and pretty nice. You can contact Eric on Twitter. Uh, you can follow his job on OCCRP also, and uh, okay. I think most of the you can pay him beers. He likes beers. I could have a beer now, actually, <laughs> <laughs> but I'm fine getting it myself. Don't worry. <laughs> Thank you, Eric. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs>